for everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. As Charles, what I like about Charles is very passionate about what he's doing, and that's something uh, I have in common with him. Uh, I'm not from the textile industry, uh, I'm a chemist, so I'll try to minimize the chemistry sections, but we'll have to talk a little bit about it. And then uh, at the end, I'd like to leave as much time as possible for you to ask questions and also give some perspective on how this technology will enable um, the textile industry, at least for the polyester fibers, to become circular, which I think is another notion that is just emerging, something that has been developed for the packaging industry in the past years, because they had the EU regulation imposing them to stop single-use plastics. And even though we are much less in love with our bottles than we are with our textile, at some times we have to consider that the textile we are producing can go back to raw materials and transform back into textile. So I will start just by introducing what is Carbios. Uh, Carbios is a, is a green tech. It's a, it's a, it's a small, in, it's a, sorry, it's an industry which is quite young. We are 11 years old. And the core business of Carbios is to look at enzyme. Enzyme are interesting because when you look in the nature, uh, it, there is no waste generation in the, in, in the nature. So you have degradation processes like with oxygen, but most of the material get degraded at the end by enzymes, which are cutting down material into smaller parts, like bricks, to remake uh, materials. If you take a tree, for instance, it could be 150 years old. It's made uh, robust because if you are uh, a tree which is uh, 80 meters long, so it's quite a uh, robust structure, but at the end, when the tree is dying, all the materials that have been used to make it living uh, for 100 years will be degraded back to simple materials that can be regenerated to make another, another uh, life cycle. So Carbios is, a, is an innovative country, uh, sorry, company. Uh, we are working with two streams of partners, the brand owners that we have worked with uh, in the packaging industry and we are building the same relationship with uh, textile people. And of course, uh, one exclusive partnership with Novozyme. Novozyme is, is actually someone who is capable of producing these enzymes at large scale. Because you will see when you tackle uh, circular economy from packaging or even for textile, you have to look at wide, wide scale, big scale. And that's important to have someone that is capable of doing this uh, in, the, in large scales. So we are the first and the only one so far, so that's normal, to have developed a biological process to recycle plastics at the end of their life. That's, that's what we are doing. And we should take that. That will avoid me to move. So uh, what is Carbios uh, doing? Uh, we have two, uh, two materials that we have looked at. One which is actually interesting, it's a bio-based material, it's called polylactic acid. Not very much used in the textile, it doesn't have the right mechanical properties. But it's a material that is biodegradable by nature, but it takes quite difficult conditions to be biodegraded. So we have incorporated inside the material an enzyme, so you can biodegrade this material in very mild conditions, like in a garden composter, so at the end, it's quite interesting if you have a tea bags, usually in tea bags, you don't know what to do with it because it has a lot of organic materials, but on the same time, it has a plastic bag around it. Here, you could put it in your composter and get rid of this material. I'm not gonna talk too much about that. I would like to talk about the uh, polyester part. Here, we took a different approach. We are not putting the enzyme inside the materials. We don't want to change that part. But at the end of the life of the material, we will put the enzyme in contact with the material and the enzyme will break down the polyester into its two constituents. Polyester is an interesting chemistry. It's actually made with two molecules, one called the terephthalic acid, the other one the monoethylene glycol, and they are attached each other next to each other in a sequence. If you are a polymer uh, designer, you can play with it, uh, make long chains, shorter chains, have a distribution of the chains. This industry has been working a lot on that, so we are not changing that part. But what we can do with an enzyme is to break down these molecules into the two constituents and then regenerate the polyesters. 
why we are looking at that, uh, we, are not the, the, we are not the first one. I think that when you look at materials, it's always important to consider that there are different ways to save uh, on our planet. It's first of all, to, uh, so here it's on the packaging, but you can see the same on the textile, is to reuse as much as you can. Uh, it's to do some mechanical recycling, so you could reprocess the material and reshape it into uh, the original material. Uh, this is sometimes what is being done when you take a bottle to make a fiber, so that's a kind of mechanical recycling. Uh, but it works only if you have a very pure feedstock, if you are only mono materials, mater because if you have mixture, then you cannot reshape the material uh, with the same properties. Uh, it's, if, it's a little bit like to take an image, if you have a different mixture of oil, you have butter and, uh, and peanut oil, if you try to remake an oil with it, it will not be uh, homogeneous and you will have a mix of properties. So it's the same here with the, with the mixed material. And this is a difficulty in the textile industry because you love and we love when we buy garments to have different uh, texture, different properties, and usually we mix the fibers compared to when we do packaging where it's a simple use and typically we have more mono materials, uh, uh, put on, mono materials uh, packaging put on the markets. People have also developed technology where they can remove some of the material uh, which are not interesting. Uh, typically, it's a small uh, chemical, so they use solvent to purify the feedstock. But here, we are talking about depolymerization. So this is, uh, this is uh, a step where you basically break down the material and get the bricks and remake uh, from that brick uh, a, new, a new fresh materials. And you have the last, uh, which has been a little bit discussed in the, in the previous talk, is that you could, of course, uh, degrade all the materials mixed together and uh, have in that uh, part uh, doing some mass balance, uh, calculate the, the amount of carbons you have from renewable uh, sources, uh, actually this renewable carbon, and, and get some mass balance approach uh, to say that you are keeping some of the feedstock. That's the whole process, so just to, to position where we are. So why Carbios looked at polyester? Well, you know it. Uh, it's the second most used uh, polymer, uh, the, the first one being the polyolefins, so the polypropylene and the polyethylene. Uh, two major applications which we started to work is the bottles, the packaging, the trays. If you buy food trays, uh, usually they're also made of polyester, uh, PET. Uh, and of course, the second most, uh, the biggest market, this is the one that uh, we are looking now, uh, it's the polyesters. Someone could ask me why we didn't look at the poly, um, polyester uh, textile first. The reason is that when you look at these processes, we need to work again at large scales, and today we don't have enough material collected to be uh, working at the scales that we need to work. Why also is it important? I think Charles started to, uh, to touch a little bit on that. Uh, if you look at all the claims, all the pledges that the brand owners have made, whether you are Adidas, uh, you are uh, HAM, whether you are a big bottler like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, uh, if you look at the amount of recycled content you want to have in your materials, whether it's a textile or whether it's a, it's a bottle, you can't have enough of the mechanically recycled materials or of the plastics just coming from the packaging to meet your pledges. So we have to find alternative solutions where we can collect more materials, we can use more materials to be recycled, so not only the mono materials, and this is where this technology of um, mechanical, uh, oh sorry, chemical recycling or advanced recycling or molecular recycling, these are the terms which are being used, will help us because they will take any waste we have, whether it's a packaging or textile, and extract the polyesters, cut it down to the monomers, and make the polymer again. And if today we can do mechanical recycling only with what is on the left side, the light colors, we are, the colored material are used to the textile, but this technology will put them back into the packaging, and this is important because the people who are putting bottles on the market or packaging on the markets, they pay for that, and they want to have those raw materials back into their hands. So this is not like 
a, a, a long-term issue, but it's more like a medium-term issue that in 2025, in 2026, there will be probably no more bottles to make polyesters, fibers. There will be only bottles made of PET to make bottles. This is also to show that we are quite flexible in the technology and uh, our processes will work on these two feedstocks, but we have demonstrated not to steal the fibers to make bottles, but if we were just uh, doing that, we can take a pile of polyester fibers, break down to the monomers, purify those monomers, and we can make bottles out of that and we tested with the brand owner, so we worked uh, in a construction brand owners, I have a slide later on, where we have passed all the properties, whether it's mechanical properties to make a bottle, it's important that the packaging is robust, doesn't break when you need it, it's transparent, or it has the right optical properties, and also uh, that it has no, no issue with food contact, so we do all the migration tests, and believe me, when you put water inside a bottle, uh, if there is something that migrate, the test will change and will be really perceived, because water has no test, as we know. So all of that is, uh, is something we could do. This is not what we want to do, but this is just to show you how flexible is the technology. We can take textile to make bottles, we can take bottles to make textile, but we can make those two industries very circular. Let's get a little bit with this cartoon on uh, how does it work to make you uh, a little bit more comfortable. So we take what is the enzyme doing? The enzyme is exactly acting like this morning or this at lunch if you had some food. We have enzyme in our body, uh, for instance, cereals, braids, is not digestible for us. The only thing we can do is to break down these big molecules into uh, glucose and glucose give us the energy. So it's transformed into the energy. The enzyme will do exactly the same. So we take the material, we modify a little bit the surface to make sure the enzyme can attack the surface, so we expand the surface basically of the, of the fibers, so this is our know-how. We mix that in water, and enzyme works in water, in moderate temperature, and uh, the cartoon is not at the right scales because we put, enzyme is a catalyst, so it's put at fraction of percent, so it's not like you need uh, the same amount of polymer and enzyme, but you need a small quantity of enzyme, and within 24 hours, less actually, within 17 hours, we'll have degraded 98% of the polyester which is present in the samples. And what is good about the enzyme is that they are very selective. So if there is other material, let's say you are working with uh, nylon polyesters or polyurethane uh, polyesters, the enzyme will only degrade the polyester, break it down to the monomers, and the other parts will be untouched. We will precipitate the solid, so the, the part which has not been degraded at the end of the reaction. And then in the solutions, you will have those two monomers. And then by doing what we do in the, in the petrochemistry, we will purify these two solutions. We will remove the color. So this is a simple process to absorb the color. And then we purify using distillation, crystallization, filtration, all kinds of technology we are used when we work in the chemical sector to get the two monomers with the same quality and the same purity. It's actually, you cannot differentiate them uh, as we get from petrochemistry. So we can remake raw material, we can remake those two raw materials from our waste. That's, that's, the, that's the simple summary. And you see here, so you start with the textile and then you can see uh, what you obtain at the end. What is also interesting is that because the monomers have the same quality, the same purity, we don't change the downstream part of the, of the process. So you can remake a yarn and the yarn has exactly the same quality as the yarn made from petrochemistry. So for the textile, uh, just to give you that we are working on it, uh, we take textile waste, we shred them, we remove the hard point. This is, the, uh, you know, we cannot work with a zipper. It's something which is a little bit difficult to, uh, to change. Then we agglomerate them, and then we get this waste pellet that we can put in a reactor. And today we are working uh, 
uh, in Clermont-Ferrand, where we are located with our uh, demonstration tools. And we are working at the ton scales to generate all the process data that are necessary to make this material at large scale. For Carbios, it was important stage. So technically, it's been validated. Uh, Carbios made the front page of uh, the scientific review Nature uh, in 2020. Uh, it was uh, an important step. It means that the scientific community, it's very important for the people working uh, as, a, as a scientist, it was recognized by all its peers that this is a changing, uh, it was actually making the front page. It is changing the way we look at our waste. We have now solutions that can eliminate some of our waste, not all of them, but at least part of them. And uh, just to show the progress, when the people start to develop an enzyme, they were degrading 3% in several weeks, which means that you can't really apply these solutions for a massive uh, production. And now we are able to degrade, uh, as I say, 97% in 16 hours. It's actually a time you decide uh, it's based on economics. TBI means uh, Toulouse Bio Institute, which is our partner. This is our scientific partners in Toulouse, where we have uh, in, uh, bio engineers. Uh, in the packaging, we and we will be doing the same. We are building a consortium of brand owners for the textile industry. We really worked, uh, just to tell you uh, that uh, we worked with some of the brand owners, and you can recognize their iconic packaging here on this uh, on these slides to really demonstrate that we could take non-food grade or food grade materials break it down to the monomers, make the polymers, and give them the exact identical packaging. They could not make any differentiation, whether it's aesthetic colors, mechanical properties, and even uh, food contact testing uh, using waste instead of using uh, petrochemistry. I think it's important. Sometimes I hear people saying, well, I mean, it's dangerous for using waste. If you think oil, I used to work in the oil industry, is a clean material probably got it wrong. It's because we are purifying oil that we are able to make food grade materials or very clean materials out of oil. Oil is, contains radioactive materials, all kinds of nasty chemistries, including minerals, that we probably don't have in our waste. Our waste are a little bit cleaner sometimes than oil. Um, on these slides, I wanted to say that uh, we, we, we had another important step. So we opened uh, our demonstration tools. So now we're working at large scales. Uh, we are based in Clermont-Ferrand, which is in the center of France. It's known because Michelin has Michelin tire industry has its headquarter there. And uh, we are working uh, now at the ton scales to generate uh, all the process design package, which is necessary to build a plant. There is one important point I may have not mentioned so far is that we don't change the, down spots, the downstream part of the, of the polyester industry. But the polyester people in the past 60 years have improved so much in their production that now a polymerization unit, so the next step, huh, we produce the two monomers and then we need to go back to the polymerization unit. This polymerization unit, they operate usually between 100,000 tons and 200,000 tons a year capacity. So if we want to produce monomers to feed those reactors and be able to have a, a polyester made from uh, waste, we have to work at that scale. And a small polymerization unit, I will just have a slide later on on what we are starting to do for the next plant, will be 50,000 tons. And so far, we, have, uh, we, we are working with uh, our engineering partner, Technique, we think, we, we think, we have data showing that our technology can be extrapolated between 50,000 tons and 150,000 tons. Uh, we, will, uh, we will also uh, validate that later on, but this is, this is the order of magnitudes we have, so we are quite compatible to go back into a polymerization unit. So this is, uh, this is all the facilities we have uh, now in Clermont-Ferrand where you can see we pretreat the material. So here I'm showing the pretreatment. It's more like for the packaging, but it will be the same for the textile going inside these things. We have a depolymerization reactor, and then we have all the purification stocks. 
which address the two raw material, which are the polystereftalic acid, uh, purified terephthalic acid and the monoethylene glycol. And these two materials will have the same purity and the same specs as petrol source materials. They will not be differentiable. So usually uh, it sounds like uh, an interesting story, but I would like to put a little bit more flesh to the, what we are doing uh, for the next, uh, next years. Uh, we are building a plant. We announced uh, in February, last February, that we are partnering with Indorama, Indorama Venture. Indorama is a big producer of polyesters for the packaging industry and the textile industry. Uh, we will build a plant. The plant will be located in, uh, in France, in uh, Long La Ville. It's in east of France, very close to uh, German, Luxembourg, and Belgium border, which is also quite interesting when you want to source uh, all the waste because this plant will have a capacity of 50,000 tons of waste. And we don't want to chase for the transparent bottles because they have a very nice end of life uh, using mechanical uh, recycling. We are more looking at material that cannot be recycled today, so the food trays or the complex packaging, the packaging that contains other materials, which is sometimes needed for, uh, for protections. And uh, the timeline is to have this plant operational in 2025. The process for textile will be quite similar, uh, and that's why I will uh, give a few data uh, we have on packaging, but we are still building them on the textile is that on the textile, we have to remove more color. There's a bit more colored material than in the packaging. This is something we know to solve, but that will be just a, a difference we will have in our process. What is Carbios? Uh, so uh, what also we are continuing is that as we build this process design package, uh, you know, 50,000 tons is like a drop in the ocean to make polyesters. As I mentioned before, we have 80 million tons. So we are also uh, looking at licensing this technology for all the PT producers. Because in the business model, basically, when you are a PT producer today, you have two options. You continue to buy uh, your two raw materials from petrochemistry, which is very well optimized. Or you start to uh, produce your own raw materials using this technology at the scale you have your reactors and start to make a polyester from uh, from waste and this licensing process is also available uh, will be available uh, in 2023 which which is almost like tomorrow uh, voila so because i want to give uh, as much time as possible to the questions uh, Finally, when you look at it, so we can make 100% recycled PET. You don't need to add uh, virgin materials because the properties are exactly the same. We, we go back to the raw materials. So sometimes you have to make mix recycled material with virgin materials to match your mechanical properties. You can handle all kinds of PET forms, whether it's mono materials, which is quite easy to recycle mechanically and more efficient that way, because here we of course spend more energy to break down the materials, but we can take this kind of clear colored, opaque, multi-layers, multi-layers, so mono materials and polyester fibers, which we cannot really recycle today mechanically. Another part is that the enzyme we have developed is not inhibited by any of the conventional fibers uh, we have found so far. There may be some upper limit for some materials Depolymerization is done at low temperature, atmospheric, so in terms of capex, it's quite interesting when you need to build a factory, you don't need to use solvents, you don't need to have uh, flammable material constraints, um, you don't need to have pressurized reactors, so it's undone at low pressure. And basically, if you look at it, we can go back all our materials and transform them into raw material. And I think it's important because, as uh, Charles says, uh, the EU, uh, on its Green Deal just published uh, March 30th. It's roadmap for the textile industry, and it's clearly said that we have to be circular. We have to reduce the amount of textile we are producing. That's normal. Uh, more reuse, uh, durability or longevity is important. But also we have to consider that material which are easily recyclable and not recycled, made from recycled content, but also recyclable. So 
you can you can put them back into uh, into the loop are the way to go and that's uh, that's probably uh, this technology will pro will likely be a, a strong enabler uh, for this approach just a word uh, okay it diverts material from landfill in this generation so we've done some LCA from the packaging industry uh, with a process uh, which is much more advanced so we are saving CO2. Uh, we, we reduce CO2 emission by 40% versus production of uh, material from uh, fossil, uh, fossil energy. Uh, we will have uh, more data. And I was very interesting in the conversations uh, developed this morning about the different indexes which are developed in the textile industry. And I'm sure we have uh, enjoyable discussions uh, around this matter uh, with people uh, involved in the industry. Voila, I think I want to give uh, the, the floor back to Charles uh, for questions, and I'm really, really uh, eager to take some questions on board. Before we get on to questions, can we show Bruno our appreciation? Thank you. Can I also congratulate the audience? That was a chemistry lesson, and I know none of you are chemistry graduates, but even I was understanding. I'd love to say it all, I understood the most of it, is what I'm prepared to say. But this is your opportunity. You've got someone who knows more than us. He's already flagged up the big principles that our source of recycled feedstock is changing. So we need to look at other evidence, other, sort, other locations to get it from. He mentioned the EU Green Deal. Things are changing. We need to be ahead of the change. Now's your opportunity to pick Bru Bruno's brain. And I've got a question at the back. Hi, thank you for the um, lecture. Um, I wanted to ask, I saw on one of your slides that you first do some sort of pre-sorting to select only materials that have at least 85% of polyester. Uh, how do you do that pre-sorting? Because I assume you cannot look at every label of the fabric or of the packaging. Okay. So you're talking about automatic sorting, effectively. Yes. So that, that, that's a minefield. If you know the answer, I'm very interested as well. No, e effectively. So first of all, when we put 85%, um, that's an average feedstock. This is the economic model which is running. We could take uh, material that contains less polyester, but uh, we know that uh, economically, if we enter something that cannot be uh, transformed into back into raw material, into um, the monomers or the raw materials, it's, it's an economic negative factor. So today, uh, this is another challenge for the textile industry because in the packaging, they have implemented uh, near infrared and they are capable of sorting material by, uh, by, their, um, by what they are. Um, this is, this is, a, this is a, the challenge of this industry. There are two big challenges in industry, to collect 50,000 tons to 150,000 tons of materials, to have a sorting which is not too precise because it's not a vision for a reuse, it's more like how much polyester is inside. So this is something that has to be built, I agree with you. And the 85% is not like we cannot process if it contains less, it's more like economically, it will, poor, it will be a poor performer. So this is more the average that we have to look at. Um, we're also getting people in our virtual audience asking questions, so I'm just gonna flick to the virtual audience. First question for Bruno, what happens to anything within the material that is not PET, that is left, uh, uh, left over after the depolymerization? So basically the contaminants. Yes, uh, extremely interesting question. So you have two ways to look at it. Where we are today and where we could be in the future. Where we are today, uh, this is an ultimate waste. So if I have a feedstock with 85% polyesters, I'm gonna convert that, and the 15% will be considered as ultimate waste. The color is only a fraction of a percent. It's very efficient in terms of uh, changing uh, the appearance, but in terms of percentage, it's not that much. But the other materials, if I have, uh, I could have nylon, I could have uh, uh, any kinds of other fabrics there, they will be considered as an ultimate waste. In the long term, what we could consider, because you mentioned that polycotton is quite uh, important materials, you could imagine to have two processes 
uh, next to each other. One first step where you separate when you have the cotton being extracted and transformed into something that can be reused. And the polyester, which is converted back to a, a virgin like polyester using this circular economy. That's a long term vision because today you will have to design those processes to be efficient and run uh, concomitantly. Co That's not an easy word in English, by the way. I prefer the, word Fren the French word, concomitant. <laughs> But uh, this, is the, this, is, this, is, this is the long-term vision. Today, it's an ultimate risk. Now, to follow on from what you just said, those British people might have heard of Warn Again, warnagain.co.uk. They're now build, they've almost completed their first industrial-sized plant up in Teesside, northeast England, where they're feeding in polycotton, and exactly as you're saying, RPET and cellulosic waste is is coming out, cellulosic waste of the quality that can be put into the ground, so non-toxic and all the rest of it. But that's just me waffling. Second question, it's an extension of the first question. How can we make sure that recycled processes, fibers and fabric is clean and certified so that it is not handled by a non-regulated worldwide market? Ah. That's a harder uh, question. <laughs> it's a hard question, but we already start to think about that for the packaging industry. They have the same questions, they have the same issues, uh, because you cannot differentiate those two materials after they have been uh, produced. So uh, there exists some tracing technology uh, on the blockchain, so it's a little bit complicated, but you could, you could implement a tracing technology. It goes for chemical commodities. Uh, it's used today for very sensitive materials where you want to trace where it's going uh, in, in countries where it's important to have tracking of this material. And that's something we are exploring today, is having a tracking records. And basically, you could, you could at every stage of the value chain, you could certify that you are using the quality of raw material that has been, uh, that you were looking for as a fabric designer. So the yarn is coming from material that are coming from renewable uh, carbon. So carbon that's coming from the waste and not from fossil energy and so on all the way down the value chain. It's also technology that could be uh, used. I'm looking now in that direction for uh, uh, probably um, sorting materials. There are some, some, some ways to look at this technology for sorting materials. Now, I've run out of virtual questions. I don't want to start picking on you. This is your opportunity. Bruno's here. Bruno, as you can tell, to embarrass him, knows more about chemistry than the rest of us. This is your opportunity to have a chemist who can explain things in terms that we understand. If you don't come up with a question, then I start to get nerdish, and I start to pick on Bruno. Bruno, I'm not getting volunteers. Bruno. <laughs> um, what I want to do is I want to go into your brain. I am impressed by the science and the chemistry, but I fear that there's going to be a lack of how much people understand and how they're going to be able to change their behavior. And that can be the fall down point so sure. in so many instances. What gives you faith that this new practice, us regular people are going to stick to? because we've got to do it slightly differently. We're somewhere in there. How, will, how successful do you think it's gonna be when we put a human and we get them to do something different? Uh, it's, it's a lot of educations. And uh, it's, it's a little bit like in, uh, in today when we need to, uh, we know for instance all our material at uh, household except for textile are being collected. Uh, we don't know what to do with our waste. We have difficulties sometimes because they say, okay, if it's made of this material, you can recycle. Sometimes you're looking at signals. Sometimes you turn around the objects and uh, it's difficult. So even as human beings, it's a difficult choice, especially with our waste. I always say the when it comes to the waste, we are more a Simpson than a spoke. So we, are, we just want to take a few seconds to get rid of materials and not to think too much ahead. So it will be the same for any uh, material we are putting on the market. So one of the difficulty is really to explain without being a chemist, without being, why we are putting materials on the market and why these materials are sustainable uh, with notions for me that 
this is not anymore a waste at the end of life, but this is raw material. This is something you can use back. We have to keep it simple. I give you a lot of explanation on, on terms of chemistry, why this is circular. But for people, at the end of the day, what they need to know is that, is this garment, end of life, assured? Can I make something out of that? Is it, is it a value or is it just a waste? And this is a value. Basically, I can put that back into the market and some people, some clever people, which building the trust, not greenwashing, capable of taking this jacket and turn it back into a new, uh, a new material which, has a, which, is, which is delivering the same performance or the same feeling as the original material I bought. Well, that last point answers a much bigger question. We are an industry where we're using biomimicry. We're trying to copy nature's practice, whether in waterproofing, whether in permeability. Can I point out there's no such thing as waste in nature? Exactly. So you're bringing up a very relevant point that we're going to come more on board with. But I'm going to force some interaction here. I live in England. We have a terrible recycling policy in England because it is not a national one. It's not even regional. Depending on what borough you are in London, for instance, is whether they take Tetra Pak recycling or not. Is it the same in other countries in Europe? Or do you have a national policy where everything's taken in the same place? Can I just ask for a show of hands? If you, if you saw a bit of plastic, would you know whether you could recycle it or not? Does anyone feel confident at that? Oh, come on, someone join me. <laughs> do I need to say more? No, that's We've true. got a confused market. I've got one more question. Um, I will be back. Sure. And sorry for being too chemical, talking too much chemistry. Well, that's because I'm a, from a different world. <laughs> I was interested in knowing more about the way of thinking once you're trying to optimize your enzyme. Is it like a trial and error thing? Can you particularly target, okay, it's not as efficient, maybe we could try this idea? Or do we have some sort of computational bioinformatics crazy tool to, yeah? Uh, it's actually, uh, there is no enzyme in the evolution of the, of the, basically enzyme are produced by a living organism. But today in the environment, you don't have an efficient enzyme which is capable of degrading polyester. Polyester is too recent in the environment to have this, uh, this uh, 81 uh, feed, using, using enzyme as a feedstock for using, sorry, producing enzyme to use uh, polyester as a feedstock or to generate energy or to generate other materials. So the starting point, uh, it's just trial and error. But if you want to know more details, we took the, the starting point is an enzyme which has been, uh, which is very specialized in uh, degrading uh, specific leaves you have on plants. If you have uh, on plants, you have sometimes you have very oily leaves, a leaf which is very hard to limit the evaporation. So it's a kind of oily uh, mechanism. So it's a hydrocarbon, uh, very rich hydrocarbon. And that's the starting point. And then with evolutions, we've been able to design an enzyme which is quite efficient on polyester. Thank you. Um, I can't see any other hands. Hence, can I ask us, oh, I've got one more hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're doing very chemistry. well. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. Thank you. Uh, I have a commercial question when it comes out to the price. Um, um, do we have already calculation in compared to a virgin euro per kilogram? Okay, uh, I will give you just, uh, depends what you are taking. But I will give you, um, of course, we do some economics. Uh -huh. When you start, you're not going to be at par with virgin polyester. It's optimized for 60 years. As I said, now they are using uh, two 200,000 tons uh, capacity, and the unit they are producing in, uh, in Texas, for instance, the last units will have a 400,000 tons capacity per year. So this is just uh, very optimal. So when we look at it, where do we start? Today, we start being twice more expensive than uh, recycled materials. But what is important is to look at how you can improve with time. Because all these industries, all these processes we are developing, all re it's, it's not made of very new tools. It's the way we're just setting up all these stages of 
preparing samples, hydrolyzing with an enzyme, and then purifying. When we discuss with consultants, uh, they believe that within five to seven years after a uh, unit is in operations, we should be competitive with polyesters produced uh, using oil with the dollar, with the, uh, we need to take a reference point with a barrel of oil at $80. That's there, um, which means that on the long term, we will be efficient to use materials versus oil. And oil is going to keep up uh, growing. There is, in the oil, there is one, one curve I always like to enjoy, is how much, when you look at the energy you have to spend to produce a barrel of oils, is how many barrel equivalent of oil you need to spend before you collect uh, one barrel of oil. And this gap is reducing up to the point where we will spend so much energy to collect oil that you can only use oil to make materials. We, we are getting to that gap. So oil is only going to increase, even though we have plenty of oil now huh, because we are getting it uh, to, to more and more complicated solutions. But it's important to keep in mind that for this kind of process on the long term, we will be uh, competitive. Uh, one more question about the depolymerization process. Uh, we saw a few steps you have to, to make. Is this not very energy driven or do you have a comparison to a normal process? So, if you, uh, energy to make a PTA and MEG from petrochemistry is it's quite, a, it's also a lot of energy and the purification steps are also a lot of energy. What is more efficient once you have the polymer is to do the mechanical recycling, which you can only do if you have pure materials. So we are just in between. We are less energy intensive than uh, starting with crude oil. We are more energy intensive than starting, uh, than doing mechanical recycling, but we have more possibilities and especially in the textile because there is no way you can take textile and convert it back to, uh, to polyester. And as I said, uh, I don't have the exact number right now on the LCA for the textile, but uh, we, will, uh, we will have data being uh, generated uh, soon. At the Why we don't publish? Because it's important to generate the data at a scale where they are relevant. At lab scales, you cannot generate things which are very relevant. But we know we'll be better than crude oil, for sure. Thank you. Uh, you have one more question. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just um, wanted to um, ask you, is it that you want to have most of the raw materials from polyester in the end? Is that the, is that the end goal, that you're making polyester from polyester textiles? No, that's not the end goal. Uh, I, don't want to, uh, I don't want to have the textile industry and everybody frustrated saying we need to have 100% material white, because <laughs> that would be the easiest way to work. It's important that we continue to make uh, blends of material if they bring something uh, they are needed and so on. What I'm saying is that economically to recycle using this kind of process, the higher the polyester content is, the better it is. Okay, but so it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be pure. It doesn't have to be pure. Okay. If you have like a material containing, and that's why I said we, we, we look at an average of the whole pile of material we're gonna collect, what we would like to have is 85% polyester and the rest being anything else after the sorting, but it's just from an economical perspective. So I think we've now run out of questions, but before I close this, I'm gonna embarrass someone in the audience. There were a few big influencers who even I look at, and when they do things, when they're here taking notes, I take a really big subtle hint that this is coming in, we need to know about it. We have the technical editor of World Sports Activewear in the audience. Now, if they're covering it, we need to know. We might not understand, but we need to know. It means it's incoming. But much more importantly, Bruno not only did a good presentation, and we were able to understand the concepts of chemistry, He's done a brilliant set of questions. Can I ask you to show your appreciation again to Bruno? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.